you know, here after the aftermath of the hurricane, all of us survived the flooding. I'm so glad. I heard that down here was a mess. They had like what you said, about five feet of water. The river flooded, and they had to close the roads. Harry had trouble getting to the office on Tuesday when he came to see me. So we're all here. We're all doing great. I'm glad to see you. I have a few announcements to share, including one that I accidentally left off of the important thing. Um, if you take a look at the very back, you'll see important dates. On September 18th, we have the Ronald McDonald House dinner, and it is once again going to be the dinner that we buy and bring to the Ronald McDonald House. So if you would like to help in delivering with that, either raise your hand, Lots of important events happening soon. We have all kinds of me uh, meetings, but also worship opportunities, including blessing of the animals with a rain date in October. Uh, we have fireside worship, one in October, one in November. I only put the October ones here. And you know what? We have the choir's first performance coming up. And by performance, we mean musical offering unto the Lord. And that is September... 12th? 12th. So if you are as excited as I am to have our choir back and to maybe even participate in singing in the choir, you know who to contact, Christian over there. Anything you want to say about that? Because we've got to work on miking for uh, make sure that the folks at home can hear the choir. We also, if you would like to turn to the inside back cover here, we have some other announcements to share, including that I know we mentioned last week that we have the silent auction coming up. We decided that it is in the best interest of our church family and friends to postpone that until May. Um, things have, are escalate, escalating very quickly with the Delta variant, and I just want everybody to stay safe, and your admin council made that decision, and I think it was a very prudent decision. So be aware that we will not be having it on the date in October that we said we would. Originally, we will be having it sometime in May, so please keep your ears out later in the year for information about that. Also, I want to share that we have still have evening prayer happening on Tuesday and Thursday through the end of September. If you have not joined me live or watched uh, and worshipped after it's been posted, please do. It's a great time. You've heard me plug it for three months. You don't need to hear me plug it anymore. Also, if you have not uh, read Amy Jill Levine's book, Sermon on the Mount, or even if you have, uh, we are having a Bible study on that book. It'll walk us through the Sermon on the Mount. And it'll be starting the first full week in October. We're working on dates. It might be Tuesday night. It might be Thursday morning. It might be both. So stay tuned to hear about that. I feel like there were more. There's so many announcements. Everybody that uh, has email should have gotten the newsletter and everybody who does not have email, they should be mailed out, or they should be getting to your mailbox early next week. So um, please do look out for that. There was a lot of info on there. We have a lot going on, and I am so blessed that we're able to be back uh, in almost full swing, not quite because of the silent auction, but almost full swing in our fall programs and worship opportunities. Are there any other announcements to share? All right, well, I do want you to uh, stay tuned for other important dates that we'll be adding. I just wanted to keep us through October. 
but we do have Interfaith Thanksgiving coming up, and Iva will tell us in October how we can begin collecting for Thanksgiving dinners for our brothers and sisters who have need. So we'll hear more about that later. Okay, well, with all of that said, I think I remembered everything. There was a lot going on. Uh, with all of that said, I will turn it on over to Christian for the prelude. Thank you for your beautiful music and for sharing it with us and with the Lord. As we begin our time of worship, I invite you to stand, if you so choose, for our call to worship, which is called a litany to honor women, since we are hearing about Paul's missionaries and folks in Rome who were women in our New Testament passage today. We walk in the company of the women who have gone before, Mothers and sisters of the faith, both named and unnamed. They are the judges, the prophets, the martyrs, the warriors, the poets, and the saints who are near to us in our scripture. We walk in the company of Esther, who used her position as queen to ensure the welfare of her people. We walk in the company of the unnamed woman with the issue of blood, who audaciously sought her healing and release. We walk in the company of Phoebe, who led an early church in the Roman Empire. We walk in the company of one another. Our opening hymn is number 695. I invite you to sing, and if you are at home, you can find this on your screen. It's called, O Lord, May Church and Home Combine. I've been told you know the tune, so don't be surprised if it sounds familiar. Let's sing together.
As we invite the Lord God into our hearts and minds this morning, I share with you, we have an opening prayer, and you can find it, at, if you're at home, you can find it on your screen. If you are here with us in person, you can find it in your bulletins. Let us welcome the Lord together. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts. For as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we're back to the Apostles' Creed. I know I've been throwing all kinds of different creeds at you over the past month or so. I had fun. I hope you did too. But we're back home with the Apostles' Creed. As usual, we pronounce it not because God needs a reminder of what we believe, but because we do. We need to remember what we understand about who God is in our scriptures. So let us say it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we do have a little one among us today. We have little Amaya, and we have her great-grandpa, Ken. And I think we can convince Amaya to come forward and help us learn something new. Is that okay, Amaya? Do you want to sit with me? Can we sit? Will the camera see us? Do you want to sit with me? You can if you want. You don't have to. Can the camera see us, Doug? All right. Well, I want to know Amaya. Amaya is very shy, so if she doesn't talk, that's okay. Right, Amaya? I think great-grandpa can help us. Well, I want to know if you can ride a bike might be a little young to ride a bike, huh? Can you ride a bike? You can? Wow, that's amazing. Well, are you going to leave me hanging, Amaya? She's going to leave me hanging. Can you ride a bike? It used to. Wow, well, riding a bike is really special, but if I've never, pretend I've never been on a bike before, I would need to know how it feels to hold the bike steady and balanced. So how can I do that if I've never ridden a bike before? A lot of kids, when they learn to ride a bike, what do you use on your bike to help you with that? The training wheels, that's right. We put training wheels on our bike. Did you learn how to ride your bike with training wheels, Amaya? Yeah? Yeah, did your great-grandpa help you? Maybe he might have helped you. We don't know. <laughs> But I'm sure all of us out here, I bet all of them use training wheels too. Do you think so? Well, these little wheels help keep us balanced on our bike when we get on it for the first time, don't they? Because without them, we might, we might want to fall over on our bike. Now, it helps to give us peace when we're riding our bike because we know that something will catch us if we fall, right? Well, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, which is a really, really big way of saying there's a guy in the old church a long, long time ago, and he wrote a letter to this one church, and he said that they should have peace. What is peace, Amaya? What's peace, church? Peace means several different things. Maybe it means being calm and quiet. They're being very calm and quiet, aren't they? They are. Are you being calm and quiet? I, she's being very quiet. It means there's no fighting or arguing among people. It 
means not being upset or having scary thoughts. And in that letter to those people, Paul says that Jesus is our peace, right? Because in Jesus, we can find peace and comfort. And when I think about peace, I think about just being still and quiet, just like you are right now. You have a lot going on in your head, but maybe you're just able to listen to the Lord right now. Paul reminds us that Jesus is peace, and just as I can trust in Jesus, I also feel this sense of peace in everything that I do, including getting on that bike with training wheels, so that when I don't have my training wheels, I can still have that peace, just like you, because you know how to ride a bike. I bet you're really good at it, aren't you? Yeah. Is she good at riding her bike, Grandpa Ken? Yeah, that's great. So we can trust in Jesus just like we can trust in our training wheels, right? And Jesus will help us to get on our way and go really fast later in life. Isn't that right? Well, can we put our praying hands together, church? And we're going to pray. Repeat after me, okay? Dear God, thank you for reminding us that there are many ways to feel peace. Thank you for the calm presence of Jesus, who is our peace and always with us. Amen. Well, thank you, Amaya. And you've got a really pretty dress on today. I bet that you are going to do great things today for God. Isn't that right? And so are all of you. Well, thank you, Amaya. I'll let you have a seat now, but do you want to give me a high five? That's okay. She's very shy. That's okay. Thank you for being up here. That was great. I think sometimes, I think sometimes all of us are shy. Isn't that true, church? So she doesn't need to feel bad about that. All of us have times when we're <coughs> uncertain, but I think that Amaya deserves a round of applause for coming up here and for sharing with us how we can have peace in Jesus. Thank you for your help, Amaya, and great-grandpa Ken. Now we are going to hear some special music from Amy Johnson and our music director, Christian. It's called My Sister's Hands.
Amen. The perfect introduction to our at least New Testament passage, which will be about how our sisters in Christ have served in Paul's day. Before we hear about that, we need the Holy Spirit to illumine us. So if you would like to pray with me our prayer for illumination, you can find it in your bulletin or on your screens. Guide us, O God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament reading comes from a book that we don't read a lot, and it is Song of Solomon. And I forgot to mark my pages, so I hope I can find it pretty quick. And it is going to be from chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. The voice of my beloved. Look, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, and the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Our New Testament passage comes to us from Paul's epistle to the Romans, which, as Amaya helped us learn, is a letter written to the Roman church. And we're going to hear from chapter 16, the final chapter, verses 1 through 16. And there's a lot of, like, ancient Roman, Greco-Roman names in this. So, like, be really kind and be really glad that I didn't ask you to read it. Right? I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at Sancreae, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints, and help her in whatever she may require of you. For she has been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, who work with me in Christ Jesus, and who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who was the first convert in Asia for Christ. Greet Mary, who has worked very hard among you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who were in prison with me. They are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, my co-worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my relative Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers of the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and greet his mother, a mother to me also. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers and sisters who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. See, you're really glad I didn't ask you to read it. I keep forgetting what I need to do. I know that this church has a history of laypersons reading the scriptures, so I will try to make that uh, a, another thing that we do now that we're moving forward with a lot of our programs. We can include others in our, our worship again, so stay tuned for how you can participate in that. But I want to know, when is the last time that you hand-wrote a letter? 
Now, I'm going to tell you a story. This isn't the most recent letter I've handwritten, but I do want to tell you about a memorable letter from my past. My freshman year of college, a group of my best high school friends and I decided to write short notes and letters to each other in order to make keeping in touch a little bit more fun and different. This was shortly after texting on mobile phones became widespread, and yet before the dawn of the iPhone. So I'm aging myself a little bit, I'm sure. So we turned to letters. Imagine that. We wrote each other letters, sent little mementos, and gave each other something to look forward to in our campus mailboxes. I remember specifically one set of letters that I wrote which contained a gift that was, in fact, illegal. Randolph-Macon College, where I went to school, was split in half by train tracks. And what my friends and I decided to do was to place pennies on the train tracks and let the train run over them and flatten them, which we learned is illegal, but we did it anyway. And we would collect as many of the flattened coins as we could find, and I sent them to all of my friends from high school. But apparently my dear friend Anthony received his envelope empty with a penny-sized hole in the corner where the edge of the flattened coin had torn the envelope open in transit. So he didn't get his little penny. Still feel bad about that. Most of our letters were short and silly and full of well wishes for the misery that was the deluge of papers and exams that characterized our college experiences. I mean, it was really great and we had so much fun. The campaign was indeed short-lived. Nobody has time to write letters anymore. But we did have fun and we actually got to use our mail for something other than sending off scholarship applications or whatever teenagers use the mail for. Our letters were not nearly as serious as Paul's letters, especially his letter to the Romans, which contained some of the deepest theological statements that can be found in scripture as a whole. You know, at Duke, I met scholars who would dedicate their whole dissertations to just one chapter or even one set of verses within a chapter. That's how dense Romans is. But we can't forget its genre first as a letter addressed to a very specific church community. Our passage from Romans 16 will make sure that we don't forget that but with all of its personal greetings and call-outs. So what's going on in this final chapter of Romans? This is the closing section of Paul's letter. It follows a very common letter formatting style known to educated Greeks in the day. Just like we say, dear X, write the body of the letter and then put like sincerely in our name, so-and-so, whatever, at the end. Paul has a specific format that he follows in his letters. And the format kind of reminds me of a church service. In the beginning of our services, if you turn to your bulletins, what do we always do first? Well, after we greet one another before the service starts, right? We love to greet one another here at Mount Lebanon, and we love to greet our friends at home. Everybody wave to your friends at home in the camera over there. Hi, friends at home. So we love to greet each other. We love to say hi, and then we have a time of prayer and reflection, don't we? Then we get down to business. Maybe we, we have a sermon, we have some special music, we have maybe a sacrament or two. And then with some final prayers and songs, we leave with a benediction, don't we? That's how we do it, right? You guys are quiet today, gosh. For Paul's letter to the Romans, it's like our passage is part of the final prayers and songs part of the service, right? He's giving his final instructions. He's giving his final sentiments. Then, as was the fashion, he ends the letter with a benediction, just like we do in church, which comes after the section that we read. And that benediction, rather than just a pronouncement of peace, is really, in Romans, a doxology, a declaration of praise. Paul writes, now to God, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles, 
according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Nobody ever accused Paul of being brief, huh? Great, so we've got the closing of the letter. Why am I dwelling on this letter format stuff? Because it's the Roman church's introduction to Paul. Paul hasn't ever met most of the congregation members in Rome. He hasn't visited them yet. And this is his first official contact with them. Here's what he says to them from Romans 1, the very beginning. For I am longing to see you so that I may share with you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, or rather so that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as I have among the rest of the Gentiles. He's so keen to visit so that he can bring them greater faith and discipleship, especially given their context in the city that is the seat of power in the empire. Rome was, after all, the emperor's city. Its people worshipped the emperor's gods on pain of death. Its people sacrificed and paid respects in the ways ordained by the emperor. And that made it both dangerous for the Roman church, but also for Paul, a really great mission field. And he's making this first contact with the Roman church so that he can one day make his way, as Bill told us so many months ago, all the way where? Where does he want to go? All the way to Spain. That's a long way for an ancient guy to ride on a cart or go on a boat or whatever, walk on the road. That's a long way. And he wants to go all the way there. You can hear him talk about it in chapter 15. Thus I make it my ambition to proclaim the good news, not where Christ has already been named, so that I do not build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him shall see, and those who have never heard of him shall understand. This is the reason that I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now... With no further place for me in these regions, I desire, as I have for many years, to come to you when I go to Spain. For I do hope to see you on my journey and to be sent on by you. But the contents of this letter to the Romans as a whole, Paul is simultaneously introducing himself to the Roman church, offering some teaching and doctrine, and making his own pitch that he himself is the kind of missionary apostle that they need to support. Remember that there are all kinds of apostles out there. There's all sorts of other ones, some legitimate, some not. And Paul wants to be the one to help the Roman church believe because he believes that it's his God-given calling. And in conveying that message that it is his calling to come and visit with them on his way to Spain, Paul plays every card in his hand. And his final card is name dropping. He names all of the prominent people in the congregation, just like he's BFFs with them already. Like they played poker together the other night, which of course they wouldn't because it's Paul. But we have, you know, Andronicus and Ampliatus and Urbanus and Stachys and Herodion and Rufus. And even more than this, he's dropping women's names. Take verses 3 to 5, for example. Greet Prisca and Dekila, who work with me in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Greet also the church in their house. Prisca and Aquila are a wife-husband duo who hold church meetings in their home and who have already have a history of working with Paul, unlike many of the others he mentions. It's worth mentioning that this duo shows up in other scripture passages as well, including in Acts. But in those passages, Prisca is referred to as Priscilla, or in English, Priscilla. But she's a woman whose ministry has been essential to Paul in the past. And then there's Phoebe, 
She sounds like a woman with money who has supported the work of Paul and others in evangelizing. And it's interesting that hers is the first name in the list of call-outs. Did you notice that? I wonder if she may be about to visit the Roman church, or even that she might be interested in helping them, since Paul has taken the time to commend her to them so that they can welcome her and help her in whatever she may require of them. No doubt Phoebe is an important figure already, but she may prove even more important as the Roman church gains believers. Now, regarding another standout female that Paul includes, Junia, there has been much debate. In an argument made only in recent centuries, many people, namely men, have tried to prove that Junia isn't a female after all, and that the name we find in the Greek form is actually a Greek form of the male name Junius or Junianus. This theory does not hold water in recent scholarship, and there are a lot of reasons why, mostly because it's a new argument. Even the great scholars and teachers of the past, all the way back to the fourth century with John Chrysostom, there's an early priest whose written words are famously potent. All these people, even back then, accept Junia as a proper female's name. There have been arguments based on Greek grammar that Junia, or as some translations call her, Julia, even though there's a Julia later in the passage, that she wasn't herself an apostle, but rather just known to the apostles. You know, Paul owned church yet. He needs clout. He needs to present in this letter a reason why these folks should listen to him. His name dropping serves that purpose. By mentioning them, Paul is saying to the congregation, my understanding of theology is trustworthy and you should support me because he's in it for the long haul all the way to Spain. He needs the Roman church's support. He's going to launch his ministry beyond the empire to all the Gentiles since their geographic location makes them uniquely poised to help him fulfill that mission. All this being said, I applaud women in ministry of all kinds, and I know that female leadership is an important aspect of Mount Lebanon's history. Here I am proud to stand and continue a long line of powerful female pastors and to serve a church that understands Paul's commendation of female leaders by commending its own female leaders, both clergy and lay. We have many female leaders in this room, all of you who are women, identify as women, find yourselves a leader in some capacity, I'm sure. I'm proud to serve in the UMC, where women, at least on paper, are deemed equal in value and ability to serve God. We still have a lot of work to do. I urge you to allow this passage to help you question any long-held beliefs about who ought to serve in the church, or maybe who ought not to. This passage serves to ask us, is there anyone who's incapable of furthering the mission of God in the world? I know how I would answer that question, and I hope that as you think about this, you'll be able to find your own answers too. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the women, women that Paul mentions and the women in our own lives who raise us up, who teach us the gospel, who are examples for us of what it means to follow Jesus. We thank you for those men in scripture and in our lives who have made way for them, used their voices to allow these women a voice. Even though many of us may have a complicated relationship with Paul, we see here just how much he valued many of the women in his life. Thank you for showing us that all are able to proclaim the gospel and to help in some way in your kingdom. Maybe some of us, Lord, in our lives have doubted that. Maybe we've doubted ourselves. But we know, Lord, that you 
are calling us, every single one of us, to something. Some purpose that we have fulfilled or have yet to fulfill in your kingdom. Knowing that we're not alone on the journey. Help us to support one another as the Roman church does, did. Help us to lift one another up. To esteem one another. And to be brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Our hymn of response is called Bind Us Together. And it is the perfect one to read after this passage about how so many people have a place in the kingdom of God. It's in this little black book, if you're here in person, called The Faith We Sing. If you turn to 2226, and if at home you'll turn to your screen, let us rise as you so feel invited and sing together, find us together. And we sing it, do we sing it twice? We sing it once through and then the refrain again. have reached that time in our service when we share with one another the blessings that we've received over the past week and the prayer concerns that we have for those both within our church and throughout the world. We keep in our hearts many of those that we've been mentioning and praying for. For example, Tracy Hopkins, I talked with her. She was going to try to be here today, but I know that she has had periodic, uh, periodic issues with vomiting. Um, and she had surgery, uh, routine surgery, in the past couple weeks. So we hope that that's not a complication. And we keep her in our prayers. We also have been keeping in our prayers Iva in the death of her former husband. We were praying for him last week as he was ending his fight with metastatic cancer. And she shared with me... Saturday or Sunday night that he did pass away and the kids were able to be with him and spend time with him and he, I think he was able to even say a few things to them isn't that right Iva he was able to say a few things to them and, and they were able to, to say goodbye so we give thanks for him and for his life and for the life that he and Iva brought forth and we support Iva in this and the kids in this time we also support her brother, Jay, who had surgery, and Iva said that he's, he's home now, is that correct? Oh, he's still in the hospital. Okay, maybe that's where I got that. <laughs> I apologize for that. He will be going to a skilled nursing facility soon, but he's still in the hospital. He came through his surgery well, and doctors are optimistic, right? Right, so we keep Iva and Gail and Casey in our prayers, and we also keep Jay in our prayers, even as we give thanks for his uh, healing. We've also been keeping in our prayers Harry back there. He, uh, 
He's here with us, and we're very happy for that, and he continues to battle through pain. But you're making your way, aren't you, Harry? And we're so glad that you're starting to feel a little bit better, and we pray for quicker healing for you, because I know that you've been dealing with pain for a long time. We also mentioned that Melissa had her 13th kidneyversary, and so we're so happy. Come on. She had a kidney transplant 13 years ago, and she is doing well. But she shared with me that her friend John, who was a kidney buddy, and we keep. Bonnie in our prayers, who is, for those of you at home who couldn't hear, um, her friend John's wife, who passed away this week. We keep Scott in our prayers as he goes through some tests. And of course, uh, we give thanks that he came through a surgery well. I don't think he wants to share more than that. Is that correct? I know he ate some really good Chinese food afterwards, so he's feeling pretty good. <laughs> And we give thanks that Bernice is back with us. And you were traveling, weren't you? Yes. Well, I know Barbara's still at the beach. Good for her. Yeah, but she still gets to have a good time, and we don't. <laughs> we're glad that all of those of us who have been traveling are, are doing well, and we pray for all of those who are returning from a Labor Day weekend. I feel like there's more. I can't remember. But does anybody have anything to share? Oh, this is what I wanted to say. For those of us who have friends in New Jersey, all of the tornadoes that occurred due to the aftermath of Hurricane Ida, I know it left a lot of damage. Uh, so we pray for our friends just, just a couple miles that way who are dealing with the aftermath of that. And all of our friends who maybe in the South or Midwest, who, who came, the hurricane came through. I know that a lot of places are flooded, a lot of lives have been lost, and we pray for our friends in New Orleans and Louisiana who are struggling with no, having no power. Anything else to share? Sherry. Yes. Thank you. Is that a good thing? He awoke from his coma. Wonderful. Wow. Good. What a joy. Thank you for that update. Yeah, did you guys even notice? The wall is painted. Yeah. Mm. Yes, a round of applause for all of our trustees and all of our trustee friends who help to make projects and improvement projects and maintenance projects in our church happen every week. And this one is a, is a big, big victory because that wall had some trouble for a long time. So thank you for mentioning that. And we continue to pray for Seth's healing and give thanks that he has awakened and he is, I'm, I'm so glad you gave us that, that update. We continue to pray for our brothers and sisters who are once again under a Taliban regime, especially those who, whose religious freedom is being, uh, being hurt, I suppose, and diminished, and, and those whose actual freedoms are being diminished as well, including those refugees who were left behind. Let us go to the Lord God in a posture of prayer. Almighty God, you are a healer. You are a way maker. You are a giver. Thank you for 
the ways that you show up for us every day. You've given us a chance to live good lives of service to you, to enjoy the little things, and to grow no matter how old we are as your children. We ask that you keep in your arms Iva and Gail and Casey, Jay, Tracy, Carrie, Bonnie and John's family, Scott, Seth, all of those who need you in the aftermath of Ida, and all of those who need you who are struggling in Afghanistan. We have a lot on our hearts today, Lord. But we know that you can handle these things. Because you are bigger than we are. You are everywhere. You see all the need. And you deploy your servants. All of us and all Christians. To help one another. We praise you for your blessings. And the ways in which you have empowered all of us to serve. We especially give thanks for scriptural role models like Phoebe and Junia and Prisca who show us that there is no limit to who can be a part. We give thanks for all of your actions in this world. We love you and we will continually praise you. Amen. We have now come to that time in our service when we offer back some of the abundance that we've been given. There are many ways for us to do that. Some of us are able to place our gifts in the plates that will go by in just a minute. Others of us prefer to give online. Others of us prefer to send our tithes into the church office. However you give, thank you. And if you're not able to give of your funds, I know that you give of yourself every single day in the body of Christ. Thank you for being who you are and for living into who God called you to be. I invite our usher to come forward as we pray over those gifts that we have given and will give. Almighty God, you have given us not only the gifts that we use spiritually in our lives, but those gifts that we now give back to you. Enable these to be magnified before you like the fish and the loaves, that they can serve those in your world through this church who need you the most. We give thanks for you. Amen.
Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, using the prayer in your bulletin under confession and pardon or on your screen if you're at home, we offer our prayer of confession before God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Pray us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us when we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. <laughs> it is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to the Lord our God, and so, who, who created heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name, and we join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and at home and on these gifts of bread and cup, including our prepackaged elements. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, I invite you to pray the Lord's Prayer, which you can find in your bulletin or on your screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Having hand sanitized before I began, just want to make sure that you all know that. As there is one loaf, so we are one body in Christ Jesus. This cup is a sharing in the blood of Christ, and it means that you are redeemed in the Lord. This table is not my table. This table is not your table. Whose table is this? This is the Lord's table, and at this table all, and we mean all, are welcomed. We will partake by receiving these prepackaged elements here. Several months and I finally got the name right, prepackaged elements. I don't know why I keep wanting to call them something else. But if you pull back the first layer, you will find a wafer. Hold it until everybody has received theirs. And I will pronounce a blessing and we may eat together. Then we'll peel back the second layer and there is juice inside. I know it's terrible. I know we're only doing this because of the pandemic. One day we will get back to doing this normally. But it is a blessing that we have been able to use these to continue the, our celebration of the sacrament. I invite the usher to come forward and make sure everybody has what they need. These have all been blessed in the sight and participation. I've got one right here. Thank you. Of all of us here today. We always say at the end, the table is ready. Come, let us keep the feast. However, we're staying in our seats. And I think we'll be continuing to do it that way uh, as the Delta variant rages. But know that it is still heavy on my heart that we're not able to do as we normally would. Hold it in your hand until all have received. I know a lot of us here and at home have trouble opening these. Uh, they are, they're, not, they're not the best. But you know what? I give them a lot of crap, but we are able to worship the Lord and receive the presence of Jesus today. And that is a blessing. This is the body of Christ given for you. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Once again, we're putting our usher to work. He has a basket in the back, and he will shortly come by you to collect the remains of your Holy Communion feast. As he's doing that, I invite you to pray with me our prayer after Holy Communion, which you can find in your bulletin or if you're at home on our screen. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Second time I left hanging today. Man. It's not my day, is it? <laughs> I'm making fun of you, Scott. It's okay, I'll explain it later. Our closing hymn is number 2221. It's called In Unity We Lift Our Song. And Christian has shared with me that it is the tune of a mighty fortress is our God. So if you 
would like to stand, you are invited to do so as we sing together. Now to the one who gives us peace that passes all understanding, who watches over us and raises us up as leaders, even when we don't feel like we're doing a good job, we know that we are led by this God, the God of Abraham, who loves us so fiercely and enables us to serve. May the Lord God bless you and keep you till we meet again. Amen.